let's get started. <clears throat> We're picking up, I believe, on chapter 22. <clears throat> Uh, we finished with 21. Here he has the vision, whatever you want to call it, of seeing Mr. Weasley uh, get bit. Dumbledore sends Harry and the Weasleys off. And I want to uh, pick up 468. He goes to Dumbledore's office. McGonagall takes him. And Dumbledore asks him, um, on 468. How did you see this? And Harry's like, yeah, I don't know. You know, inside my head, Dumbledore means what perspective, you know? Like, where were you in relation to all this stuff? And Harry says, I was this thing. I saw it from the snake's point of view. Okay. All right. There's Arthur Seary, you know, blood all over and such. So, just before. He sends them off via the port key, we're told, 474. It happened in a fraction of a second in the infinitesimal pause before Dumbledore said three. Harry looked up at him. They were close together. Dumbledore looked at Harry. Harry star, you know, burst into pain, and he feels like he wants to bite Dumbledore, okay? Um, we're going to see. Skip a bunch. The next morning, um, I think it's the next morning. Yeah, page 480, very briefly, 480, top of 481. Here he's talking to Sirius, and he tells Sirius kind of what he saw. And Sirius asked, did you tell Dumbledore? Yes, but he didn't tell me what it meant. He doesn't tell me anything. Sirius, I'm sure he would have told you if it was anything to worry about. No, that's not all. I think I'm going mad. Back in Dumbledore's office, just before we took the port key, I thought it was a snake. I felt like I wanted to attack him. Now, it's just the, you know, nerves from the aftermath of the vision and such, okay? And he says, no, it wasn't like that. It was like something rose up inside me, like there's a snake inside me. You need to sleep. You're in shock. Okay? So, question I have. I've, I've never discussed this passage before in all the years I've been teaching this book. Um, do you think Sirius passes that information on to Dumbledore? Because that does, the reason I ask that is it seems to me that information, that feeling that Harry has, would reinforce Dumbledore's whole decision process throughout this book for why he's done what he's done regarding Harry, why he separated himself from Harry and such. Um, nothing later on answers the question one way or the other. We're never told that Sirius has told Dumbledore about that. We never see Dumbledore's me uh, memory of Harry telling him, of Harry telling Sirius that. That is, we don't see Dumbledore talking to Sirius and Sirius, you know, relating that or anything like that. Okay, so they go to St. Mungo's and using Fred and George's wonderful new invention, the extendable ears, Page 491, here he gets to listen in to some of the Order of the Phoenix, at least, talking with Mr. Weasley, 491. <clears throat> Specifically, we hear Molly and Moody and Arthur. Very bottom of the page. Mrs. Weasley says, you know, Dumbledore seems to have been waiting for Harry to see something like yeah, well, there's something funny about the kid. No, no. Dumbledore seemed worried about Harry when I spoke. Of course he's worried. Kids seem think from inside you know who's snake. Obviously. If you know who's possessing I'm skipping a bit. If you know who's possessing him. And Harry hears that, and he just, you know, kind of, they make their way back to 
the headquarters. Harry goes off to his room, seemingly, not literally, you know, locks the door and stays away from everybody because he thinks he's being possessed. He thinks he's the weapon that Dumbledore, excuse me, that Voldemort is after, okay? Not thinking of one important detail. What's that detail? He's known someone who's been possessed by Voldemort. And he doesn't even ask Jenny. So she's going to address him later. So Harry goes up to his room, and he kind of has an argument with Phineas Nigellus. You know, Snape's ancestor. Running away, are we? No, not, you know. So he says, you're supposed to stay where you are. Dumbledore says, stay where you are. So notice Phineas Nigellus is conversing with Dumbledore and such. <coughs> and then you get at the bottom of 495 and top of 496. You know, this is precisely why I loathe being a teacher. Young people are so infernally convinced that they are absolutely right about everything. Has it not occurred to you, my poor puffed up popinjay, there might be an excellent reason why the headmaster of Hogwarts is not confiding every tiny detail of his plans to you? Have you ever paused while feeling hard done by to note that following Dumbledore's orders has never led you into any harm? No? And notice the no, the way I said it, I made it a question, because I had an inflection at the end. His is an assertion. No. No. Like all young people, you're quite sure you alone feel and think. You alone recognize danger. You alone are the only one clever enough to realize what the Dark Lord may be planning. Harry, oh, so he is planning. You know, he latches on the one thing. He may be planning. Why is this significant? How many of you have read all seven books? Some of you asked that question first. A few of you have, okay? So those of you who have read all seven books without giving anything away, why is this significant? We could go straight to the middle of book seven after this conversation. We could go straight to close to the end of book seven. Not the very end, but, you know, a couple hundred pages before the end. Because this is exactly what Harry's feeling all through book seven. You know, I thought I knew Dumbledore. I thought I trusted Dumbledore. Dumbledore never told me anything. Dumbledore, blah, 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 blah. He's a 15-year-old brat. Dumbledore is, you know, 100 plus in, you know, the wisest wizard, apparently, so to speak, whoever lived, etc. Okay. <clears throat> What's Phineas Nigellus trying to do? Two things really. One, he was a headmaster. He, you know, my mother-in-law is in her 80s. She was a school teacher, grade school teacher. She's still grade school teacher mentality. I mean, everybody she interacts with. Once a teacher kind of a thing, same thing here. What else? He's putting Harry in his place. Why? Because Harry needs to be put in his place. He needs to be slapped down a bit. All right? So, Ginny and the others come up to him, and they're like, dude. And she's like, okay, Harry, who of you know has been possessed? She says, I have. Oh, well, what was it like? And she says, do you have any big blacked out periods that you don't remember anything of? No. Well, I do. And notice she's kind of saying that present, I still do. That it's, I, there are moments from her first year has no recollection of that. Oh, Harry, I forgot. You know, good for you. So, her point is, you can't have been possessed. So there's something else going on, all right? They go and they look in Creature's little bedroom. It's Christmas morning. Hermione wants to leave Creature a nice little present. And what do they see? In there. In his little den. There's a nice picture of Bellatrix Lestrange. Okay. Uh, top of what page is that? 
504. Just before the end of that long paragraph at the, be at the beginning of the page. There is an image of a dark, heavily lidded woman whose trial he had witnessed in Dumbledore's Crimson, Bellatrix Lestrange. By the looks of it, hers <coughs> was Creature's favorite photograph. He had placed it to the fore of all the others <coughs> and had mended the glass clumsily <coughs> with spellow tape. So he's got our scotch tape holding the, you know, glass together. And Hermione says, I'll just leave it here for him to find later. And serious things, come to think of it, where is Creature? Anybody seen him lately? I, I keep looking for it and I can't find it. There's a page, I don't remember where it is. I used to have it folded back, but apparently I don't anymore. Word, get my words right. Sirius yells at Creature, get out, get out. We come to find out later what happens. Sirius, uh, Creature does. He leaves the house. Because we're going to be told, what may house elves do when they're given orders or commands? Not something a private or a corporal in the military could do. They have leeway in how to interpret. That's why you must do what with a house elf? You've got to be very specific with your terms. Okay? Frodo would have, you know, been killed by his house elf based on how he interacts with, you know, Gollum and such. So, they go back to St. Mungo's. And, let's see here. They run into Professor Lockhart. We're going to pick up on 512. But I got one question about their running into Professor Lockhart. <coughs> Why do you think Rowling throws that in? Denise is back there nodding her head looking down. Does she do anything else with Lockhart in book six or seven? No. Does she do anything else with him here? There's another little brief scene. Other than that, no. So, why include it? Is it just one of those little details attempting to make it kind of somewhat realistic? Possibly. Why else? Well, if you remember what we talked about, or when we were doing Chamber of Secrets, I talked about Lockhart's name. <coughs> what might this be showing us about him? He really is locked up inside. See, now he can't even get outside his own mind, so to speak. Everything's still about, look, I can do joined up letters. The emphasis on, is on me, okay? It's, it's almost a physical demonstration of his intellectual, whatever you want to call it, conscience handicapping. Okay. So, page 512. They're on the closed ward. And it's kind of interesting, I never thought about this that it's the closed ward. Like all, that implies, you know, all the other wards are open, okay? This is the ward for magical maladies, right? Closed implies, you know, you gotta get permission to go in there. There's one room in the Department of Mysteries that we're told the door is always locked, okay? What, what maladies seemingly are people in this ward suffering from? Burns, broken bones from, you know, magical problems? No. These are maladies of the mind, of the heart, of the soul, seemingly. Okay? So, we hear, middle of page 512, Oh, Mrs. Longbottom, are you leaving already? And Harry turns around, and notice everybody else turns around too, but Harry's like, immediately. And he sees nothing. And Harry realizes immediately who must be in the beds, hidden behind the curtains at the end. And he wants to try to get the others to turn around, to not pay attention to Neville. He wants to try to distract them. 
But then Ron Wells yells out, Neville! It's us, Neville. Lockhart's here. Who have you been visiting? And Neville's grandmother. Notice. She says, friends of yours, Neville dear. Neville's grandmother, grace, said Neville's grandmother gracefully, graciously, bearing down upon them all. Now, I'm not exactly sure what she means by bearing down upon them all, because that can be both a physical action and merely a description of her demeanor. That she might be kind of looking down on them all, giving possibly an indication of her size, or it can mean she is striding down towards them like making a beeline towards them. And notice we're told Neville looks like he'd rather be anywhere else but here. And his grandmother comes up, looks at Harry. Yeah, I know who you are. Harry, you know, shakes her hand. Thanks. She looks at Ron and Jenny. Yep, yeah, know who you are. She looks at Hermione. Yep, yeah, know who you are. Neville's told me all about you, helped him out of a few spots, hasn't he? He's a good boy. But, but what? He hasn't got his father's talent. What has she just said? He doesn't hold a candle to his father. Okay? This is Christmas. It's a big deal. It should be kind of, you know, you would hope, you know, maybe a couple of days out of the year, Christmas, Thanksgiving, let's say, you know, it's when you're going to be nice to other people. You're not going to put up, and she puts her grandson down. Ron, what? You, your dad's down there, Neville? You never told your friends about your parents, Neville? Neville, you know, looks up at the ceiling, shakes his head. She takes that to mean what? He's ashamed of Nothing to be ashamed of. You should be proud, Neville. Proud. Proud of what? That his parents are crazy. That his parents are insane. I'm not ashamed. Well, you have a funny way of showing it. My son and his wife were tortured into insanity. Hermione and Jenny, you know, clap their hands. Ron turns kind of red. They were orbs, you know, very well respected. And out comes Neville's mom. His mother had come edging down the ward in her nightdress. She no longer had the plump, happy-looking face Harry had seen in Moody's photograph. Now, are we told that when Moody shows Harry the photograph, you know, Ron's over his shoulder looking in, Jenny, or um, Hermione's over his shoulder? No, they're not. We're told that Moody shows that to Harry. So Harry has something to compare by. He saw Mrs. Longbottom in her heyday, right? Now he sees her a wisp of herself. Her face was thin and worn now. Her eyes seemed overlarge. <coughs> and her hair, which had turned white, was wispy and dead looking. She did not seem to want to speak, or perhaps she was not able to, but she makes motions towards Neville. Again, her mother-in-law, my terminology, says, Very well, Alice, dear, very well. Neville, take it, whatever it is. What does she do? It's like she has maybe something a little bit larger than this. And she comes up, and she kind of hands it to him, and we're told. Neville had already stretched out his hand, into which his mother had dropped an empty Drupal blowing gum wrapper. Very nice, dear, says Neville's mother. And Neville says quietly, thanks, Mom. His mother turns around, shuffles on back to heaven. She used to be really hard for me to teach because my mom died of Alzheimer's about three years ago. Five, six years ago. Spitting image of this description. Walk the whole nine yards. And we're told, as they get close to a trash bin, Mrs. Longbottom says, very nice to have met you all. 
Now we'll put that wrapper in the bed. She must have given you enough of it to paper your bedroom by the way. But what does Neville do? He puts it in his pocket. Okay? So we've just been told two little, I think, pretty important details. What does Neville do with the piece of paper? Describe that piece of paper. And I don't mean the actual physical, what she says. Just describe it. What in 99.99% of circumstances would that be considered? Trash. Okay? That's why she says, put it in the trash bin. She also says what? She must have given you enough of them to paper your bedroom by now. What does that mean to paper your bedroom? Wallpaper. He's been given enough of these to wallpaper his entire room. What did Dumbledore tell Neville, tell Harry, about Neville's visits to his parents in the chapter The Pensive in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire? Anybody remember? He says, I believe he visits them on the holidays with his grandmother. Well, what are the holidays? Christmas holiday, which we're given to believe is about a two to three week period. Okay? The Easter holidays are talked about in almost all the books. And then we can assume the summer break. There's no fall break, there's no spring break, so to speak. Okay? The implication is, like during the Christmas holidays, He's got to go how many times? Okay. This happened to his parents the year after Voldemort fell. Okay. So Neville's 15 now. Voldemort fell when he was one, same year, because he's born on the same day as Harry. Right. So a year later, so from four, for 14 years. Now, if he only visited his parents once or twice during the Christmas break, during the spring, during the Easter break, how many pieces of paper would he have to put up on his wall? Four times 14 is what, 52, 56? No. So the implication is every day they visit when he's home. And I think that also means during the summer vacation. Right? So Neville puts it in his pocket. Why? What day is it? It's Christmas on the closed door. What did his mother just do? She gave him his Christmas present. That's why he says, thanks, Mommy. And that's why he keeps it. This is telling us, as tenuous as it is, Neville still has what with his mother? A connection. What kind of connection does Harry have with his mother? There is none. She's dead. He can't go hold her hand. Neville can go hold his mother's hand. He might not think, <coughs> excuse me, he might not think it means anything, but he can. Okay? So, they go out of the closed ward, the door closes behind them. Hermione, I never knew. Ron, nor did I. Ginny, nor me. Harry, I did! Dumbledore told me, but I promised I wouldn't mention it. And then what does Harry do? He kind of plays his high card, so to speak. For what purpose? Well, what are we told in the beginning of this chapter? Before they leave for St. Mungo's, what does Hermione have to do? She's got to give Creature his present. And they look in the den, and there's the little picture of Bellatrix Lestrange. And Harry finishes the chapter with Bellatrix Lestrange got sent to Azkaban for using the Cruciatus curse on the lung bottom, for making them the way they are now. And, by extension, what else? For making Neville, who partially at least, 
the way he thinks he is. Remember in the scene, Goblet of Fire, Moody is doing, false Moody, is doing the unforgivable curses. Neville is sitting in front. His hands are on the chair in front of him, and he's gripping them so hard when he sees the Cruciatus curse, and Hermione has to say, stop, just stop, because she's the only one who realizes what it's doing to Neville, though she doesn't know why. Bellatrix Lestrange did that, Hermione says. That woman creature's got a photo of. Yeah. What's that telling us? You know, maybe you don't want to suck up to creature quite so much. Right? Though we're going to hear something totally opposite at the end. So, Occlumency. Snape comes in, tells Harry he's got to take Occlumency. Dumbledore wants it. Okay. Who's going to, I'm going to teach you. Harry's like, no. <laughs> I don't want you to do it. Okay. What's Occlumency? Okay. The Mency part means what? Whenever you see that, magic. Necromancy is magic to do with death or dead bodies. Arithmancy is magic to do with numbers, right? Occlumancy is magic to do with, and these two letters are transposed from the normal English language via Latin. O-C-C-U-L, put a T on, it means occult, right? What's the occult? Something that is hidden. So this is hidden magic of sorts, right? Here it has to do with sight, seeing, right? So, Snape explains, top of 519, it's the magical defense of the mind against external penetration. Harry's like, what? So he explains it. And before they go back off to school, what does Sirius give Harry for Christmas? Anybody remember? Shows up at the end of the novel. <laughs> the mirror. A two-way mirror that you can use to communicate with the person who has the other one. Which Harry doesn't think of later in the novel. So, I'm skipping all the stuff with Joe. Um, Harry has his first lesson, page 530, 531. Snape mentions the What's that? It's the ability to extract feelings and memories from another person's mind. Notice what Harry does. It's the thing he does almost every time somebody explains something that he doesn't fully understand. He tries to put it in his own words. He interprets it. He can read minds. You have no subtlety, Potter. Yes, though, no. he can read minds. Okay. Notice, Snape wants to turn it into this highly intricate, etc., etc. Okay. So, Harry wants to know, why do I, then do I have to learn Occlumency? And he says, because the usual rules don't seem to apply to you. That is, Voldemort doesn't have to be really close to you, apparently, to be able to read your mind. Right? <coughs> so, 532, Snape's talking about what Harry saw before Christmas, and Harry says, I saw inside the snake's head. Okay? Interrupting, you know, Snape and such. So Snape pulls out his wand, 534, 535, and he puts Harry under a legilimency charm. Middle of 534. He was five, watching Dudley riding a new red bicycle. His heart was bursting with jealousy. He was nine, Ripper the dog, chasing him up the tree. All the jerseys was after him. He's under the sword again, telling him, Slytherin. He sees Hermione lying in the hospital, covered in thick black hair. Dementors coming in on him. Cho, moving for the kill under the, you know, mistletoe. And he's like, uh -uh, you're not going to see that one. Right? 
So Snape, Harry asked Snape, top of 535, did you see everything I saw? Flashes? To whom did the dog belong? Why does Snape focus on that one? Why doesn't he focus on Harry feeling jealousy at Dudley riding a brand new red bicycle? Why doesn't he, you know, talk about Cho or Hermione or Cedric or the Dementors? What does that one episode, that one memory show about Harry? He hasn't had a favored life, has he? Everything hasn't been easy for him. Because we see the dog chasing him up the tree and others doing the what? Laughing. Okay? It's almost like the dog and the Dursleys are human versions of Death Eaters. They get their jollies at what? Other people's discomfort. Or another person's discomfort. So, Snape says, you did stop, you did manage to stop me eventually, that's not bad, but next time repel me with your brain, you don't have to use a wand and stuff. Harry, I'm trying, you're not telling me how, right? Snape says you know how to duel. Who taught Harry how to duel? The guy who can now do joined up writing. How good did he teach him? He did teach him, okay? So, Snape tells him, 536, you have to empty yourself of emotion. I'm finding that hard at the moment. Why? Imagine for a second, it wasn't Snape teaching him this, it was Lupin. How would it go? A much better. Why? He doesn't hate Lupin. Empty yourself of emotion means, Harry, remove your hatred for me also. Then you will find yourself easy prey for the Dark Lord, middle of 536. If you can't empty yourself of emotion, you'll be easy prey. Fools who wear their hearts proudly on their sleeves, who cannot control their emotions, who wallow in sad memories, and allow themselves to be provoked this easily. In other words, Harry, I'm just kind of, you know, Sticking you every now and then in the ribs. I'm trying to see where your soft spots are. And boy, do you have a lot of soft spots. Toughen up. I am not weak, Harry says. Then prove it. Look at the next two words. Master yourself. What problem does he have with Umbridge? She knows exactly what buttons to push. What does he do? She pushes a button and he bursts out. He isn't dead. I saw Cedric did. And what does McGonagall keep telling him? Self control. That's the theme of this book. Harry has got to learn self control. Okay? So he sees Uncle Vernon, he sees the letters, he sees Corridor. And now he says, I know what it is. And he asks, what's in the Department of Mysteries? You don't need to know. You need to practice better, etc. Okay. So here he goes off, talks to Ron and Hermione. He has a, another vision, 541. Voldemort is maniacally happy, you know. Chapter 25, the beetle at bay. Who's the beetle? Rita Skeeter, how is she at bay? And what does that phrase, at bay, mean? Yes, okay. Hermione has her in a sticky wicket, so to speak. So at bay, it's a hunting term. You let the, you know, British hunting term. You let the dogs out for fox hunting, and what do the foxes, what do the dogs do? They get the fox at bay. Or if it's in the United States and you're I, going, I don't know, coon hunting or cat hunting or something like that, you get an animal trapped in a tree with the dogs all around. What can the animal not do? It can't come down. It's trapped. Okay. So Rita Skeeter is trapped by what? What's the 
what does Hermione do? There's a legal term for it. <laughs> Blackmail or extortion. Blackmail usually involves, I give you money in exchange for you not doing something. Extortion is, you do this for me, and I won't. Okay? So, <coughs> what does she get Rita to do? Write an article for the quibbler about Harry. She's like, okay, that's fine. I can do whatever you want. No, 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 no. How is this going to be different than everything else? Everything else Rita Skeeter has ever written. This is going to be the truth. There's going to be no embellishment, no exaggeration. It will be a word-for-word -word kind of transcription of what Harry says the night Cedric died, the night Voldemort came back. Okay. Um, so he goes off on his date with Cho. He tells Cho Hermione's going to meet, and Cho you know, gets all upset and leaves. Uh, hold on. I think we can just about. In the chapter Seen and Unforeseen, Quibbler comes out with the Harry Potter article. People start coming up to him, okay, congratulating him, et cetera, et cetera. And Umbridge issues a new, what's it called? Educational decree. Any student found in possession of the magazine, the Quibbler, will be expelled. Okay? So what does every student now want? They want a copy. Okay? You know, back in 1987, Martin Scorsese directed a film. The film had poor reviews right, and was not doing well at the theaters until a segment of the population came out vociferously against it. The film was called The Last Temptation of Christ, based on a Greek novelist's novel. Okay? Had a scene where Christ was on the cross and had these delusions, hallucinations of having sex with Mary Magdalene. And it made the uh, far right wing Christian community, you know, go complete. Well, not even far right, wing, just Christian community, up in arms against it. It was not doing well at the movies until all these people came out and said, "Oh, we ought to ban this." It's blah blah blah. You try to ban something, and that just you know increases desire for it. So now that Umbridge does this, because <coughs> bear in mind, who does she represent? The government. I mean, if Joe Biden were to come out and say, I don't want anybody reading XYZ, you can be damn sure an awful lot more people would come out and say, I want to read XYZ. Why does the government not want me to you know, see this stuff? Okay. So Seamus Finnegan steps up to Harry. We believe you now. Okay. Bunch of other people. Harry has another vision. This time the vision is of um, five, no, yeah, 585 is of Voldemort in Rookwood. And Rookwood is informing Voldemort that Avery was wrong with what he told him about Broderick Bow. Now, who's Broderick Bow? Where did we see that name before? Christmas on the Closed Ward. He was on the closed war because his mind had been confounded by the devil's snare. Uh, no, it's not. Yeah, I think that's right. No, not the devil's snare. Okay? And we're going to find out why later on. He dies because of the devil's snare. So what do we see? We see Avery again get Crucianus. The poor guy just, you know, can't walk and talk at the same time. Um... Here he is another occlumency lesson, 595-91. Let's see here. Snake sees what Harry most recently saw. 
the man kneeling in a darkened room, etc., etc. So Snake puts him under a little gillum and see again, bottom of 591. As he does, Harry does a protego, protection chart. Only this time, Harry sees things that aren't his movements. His mind was teeming with memories that were not his, top of 592. The hook-nosed man was shouting at a cowering woman, while a small, dark-haired boy cried in a corner. A greasy-haired teenager sat alone in a dark bedroom, pointing his wand at the ceiling, shooting down flies. <coughs> a girl was laughing as a scrawny boy tried to mount a bucking broomstick, and we hear, enough! Why doesn't Harry know, uh, sir? Who is the boy crying, crouching in the corner? Bo sir, who is the man yelling at the cowering woman? Who is the boy in the darkened bedroom assassinating, you know, flies? Harry knows exactly who that was. All right? So why do we get this image? Is it, you know, turnabout's fair play kind of a thing? What are we now seeing? Seemingly for the first time. Just as Harry was being chased up the tree by Ripper, Snape had to deal with what? Though I began it with just as. The simile doesn't work quite well. Because being chased up a tree by a dog, by your aunt's dog, is not the same as covering, crouching, hiding in a corner, crying, while your father abuses your mother. That's what we're being shown. Snape is from an abusive household. Okay. So, they continue talking. Snape wants to know why, uh, Harry wants to know why Snape continues to call Voldemort the Dark Lord, and, you know, that kind of stuff. Centaur and the Sneak. We see Ferenza's teacher, and we hear Parvati, bottom of 602, talk about astrology. Okay. Mars causes accidents and burns and things like that when it makes an angle to Saturn and both. Ferenza. That is human nonsense. Okay. Notice. That is what, in our world, astrology, it is a, quote, real world kind of form of magic. You can look in uh, the DNJ, in the Tennessean. Both have your daily horoscope. If you were born on this day, if you were born in this month, you know, Mars is ascended, blah, 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 blah. For instance, BS. He says about the centaurs, six, bottom of 603. In the past decade, the indications have been that, as we centaurs have seen this, have been that wizard kind is living through nothing more than a brief calm between two wars. Now, this book was published in, if I get the date right, 2003. Okay? There had been about a two, three year gap between book four and this one. All right? One, two, three all came out in successive years. I think four might have also. I think four might have come out in 2000. But then there'd been this big break, okay? So in the past decade, so we're now in Harry's fifth year, right? He starts in 91. So 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96. So he's saying in the last decade, so from about 1986 to about 1996, all right? There's been a lull. Okay. Now, was there a similar lull in our world? Mm, kind of. Were there be any big, you know, outbreaks between East and West, between the West Block countries and the East Block countries? No, there wasn't. 79, you had the Russian invasion of Afghanistan, did not go well for them. It didn't go well for 
that's, you know. Um, in 88, you had the fall of the Berlin Wall. Then you had, you know, a famous historian write about the end of history, so to speak, thinking it would be the end of the Cold War and we'd all march forward into this, you know, glorious globalistic nirvana. That didn't quite happen. Or if we take it by publication date, from 95 to 2005, well, from 95 to 2000, things went along fairly well. And then we had 9-11, right? So he says, it's been nothing but a brief calm between two wars. What's that implying? There was a big war before, right? That was with Voldemort's first rise to power. There's been a you know, brief period of a break. And he's implying, second one's coming. So, let's go on. Um, Dobby shows up at their next DA meeting. Harry gets busted by Malfoy and such. They get taken up to McGonagall's office, and we see Fudge up there, and Kingsley Shackable, Dawlish, and Percy, and... Umbridge, McGonagall, Dumbledore, <coughs> okay, and finally, Dumbledore explains, you know, what the DA stands for. Dumbledore's army, page 618. So they're asking, trying to ask, Marietta Edgecombe, who was involved, and no, she can't. Why? Well, Hermione put the hex on her that put the word sneak on her head. Okay. Dumbledore puts the hex on her that modifies her memory. Okay. In this instant. And he said, you know, kind of had to do the same thing with Kingsley. Sorry. All right. Which is giving us a little indication of his abilities. We thought we saw it, you know, when he stormed into Mad Eye Moody's office. But didn't, no, no, no. That was. That was, you know, the flashbang, the, the shock and awe kind of a thing. This is the, you don't want to get on Dumbledore's bad side, okay? So Dumbledore tells Harry to be quiet. You're going to have to leave. Um, Fudge says, you're going to come quietly. Dumbledore says, no, I won't. He says, you know, I could, of course, break out of Azkaban if I wanted to. Showing us what? That Dumbledore is arrogant? No. He's just stating a fact. And Dallas kind of twitches like he's going to move for the, you know, for his wand. And he says, no, no, no. Come on. You did well in your news, but why does he say that? I remember you doing well in your news. His news are what? His sixth year exams? Seventh year? I can't remember. That's the teacher putting... This guy who now is an aura for the Ministry of Magic, back into high school. Stop. I taught you what you know. Right? And then Dumbledore does the spell that incapacitates everybody but Harry and McGonagall. Everybody. Okay? And he tells Harry, crack this off. You gotta. You gotta do it. Snape's worst memory. Snape's worst minor, uh, ministry. So Dumbledore gets canned. Umbridge is the new headmaster, headmistress. Okay. Fred and George decide they're done. And they leave. Let's see here. Harry has another vision. He gets to the Department of Mysteries. He's with Snape. Snape has to leave, page 639. Snape leaves. Mary notices. Who's got Dumbledore's pencil? Harry knows what a pensive does. And he wonders. 639, bottom, toward the bottom of the page. What does Snape want to keep from Harry? Hmm. It'd be kind of nice if I could know what 
memories Snape doesn't want me to see. So he looks in and giving the short version or jumping to the main point, let's say, go to 645. He sees the Marauders, James, Sirius, Remus, Peter, fifth year, take their exams, and Snape. And in the memory, and I still don't understand how this works out, because keep in mind, in order for there to be a memory, what is doing the, so to speak, recording? The person whose memory it is, right? So what should you not be able to do in that memory? You should not be able to, well, to see yourself or to get outside what that person experienced or saw. Okay? But when Harry goes into the pensive, we've got Snape over here, and Harry goes off over here with the Marauders. Snape's not there with them. He doesn't see this. To me, it's a big problem. It doesn't work, okay? But he goes off. What does he see? 645. James is playing with the snitch, you know, Lupin's reading a book, Wormtail's about, you know, peeing himself, and Siri says, I'm bored. I wish it was full moon. Right? Fifth year, they've just learned to be animagi. Wish it was full moon. Lupin, you might. It's painful still, right? When Lupin transforms. But what is Siri thinking? Yeah, but man, we would have fun. We could ride in the forest tonight. Right? And James says, this will lighten you up, Padfoot. And there's Snape. Why do they go after Snape? The same reason Sir Edmund Hillary climbed Mount Everest. Because it was there. That's it. They went after Snake the exact same way the Death Eaters went after the Marauders family. Because they could. So Harry sees all this. He sees what a dirtbag his father is. He sees how his mother doesn't like what his father does. And he hears Snape say, 648, I don't need help from filthy little mudbloods like her. And he feels Snape's hand on his shoulder. Fun. What does Snape do as a result of that? No more occupancy. I'm not teaching you. And if you speak a word of this. And what does Harry do? He speaks a word. He asks Lupin and Sirius about it. And I'm skipping for just a moment. Most of the chapter of uh, I think I am of career advice. We'll come back to it briefly. Um, yeah. Page 670. Lupin and Sirius attempt to say, Harry, come on, man. We're only 15. Hello? I'm 15. Harry says. I don't do that kind of, you know. <laughs> and they admit, we were jerks. Snape would try to do the same thing. Not the point. What does seeing that memory do for Harry about Snape? It humanizes him. It makes him see Snape as what? He's kind of like Dobby, beaten down. This explains an awful lot of why this and the other memory of why Snape is the way he is. I mean, if you are constantly being beaten down, Beat up by your father, maybe not physically, but emotionally at least, wouldn't you possibly turn to something that might give you some sort of power? In our world, what is that sort of power? A weapon. What are the dark arts? They're a weapon. They can be used to protect yourself. Yeah, they can lead you off into other stuff, just like, you know, or joining the gang can help protect you. They can also lead off to some other stuff. And what are the, you know, Death Eaters other than a gang? Okay. Um, very quickly, career advice. What does Harry want to do? <coughs> Be an Auror. 
But who says, come hell or high water, if it's the last thing on earth I'm going to do, you're going to be in order. But God will. Notice the pressure that was put on Aaron. Okay. All right. When we come back Wednesday, because we're going to finish this on Wednesday. Yeah, yeah we got to finish it on Wednesday. We're not going to talk about Grop. We'll talk about Grop briefly later. And I'm only going to say one comment about the chapter Owls. So we'll pick up primarily with chapter 32, Out of the Fire. I'll turn on the second Harry Potter quiz. Uh, I'll turn it on today. It's going to be due Wednesday night.